You know, I'm, I'm trusting and hoping that all of you had a fantastic Thanksgiving. Thinking of everybody at our Bolingbrook campus, 95th, Wheaton, Hobson, uh, love the season. You know, we are officially in the Christmas season yet. You may not feel it. You're like, hey, it's not even December yet. Yeah, well, the, the Christmas holiday season begins with the end of Thanksgiving. And so we are celebrating by starting a Christmas series this weekend called Midnight Clear, and I'm really, really looking forward to this series. Uh, Maybe to help you get in the mood, I I thought I would show you a little video about a uh, Christmas service last year at a church in Tennessee, White Pines, Tennessee, First Baptist Church. They had this Christmas program where the elementary school kids were in a choir singing Christmas songs, and at the same time, some preschoolers kind of reenacted the nativity, all right? Maybe this will get you in the mood. Let's watch. This this little girl, her name is Tegan Benson, and she's a sheep, you can't tell. She's a sheep. She's not probably real excited to be a sheep. It's kind of a lame role. I mean, look at Mary. She's got a blue gown, and the angel's got a pretty cool halo, and poor Tegan. I mean, she didn't even get a sheep hat. I mean, these other sheep at least got a wicked cool sheep hat, but they ran out apparently, and so Tegan's just kind of lost. What is she looking for? Maybe Grandma? Grandma, are you out there? Oh, I see you. Hi, Grandma. There she goes, huh? What else can I do? Let's see. I'll, I'll check on baby Jesus, make sure he's doing okay. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> I love it. Oh, baby Jesus is so cute. Look at him. I'll give Jesus some love. Huh? Isn't that great? <laughs> Jesus, would you like to dance? Let's dance, baby Jesus. Here we go. Wee. Now Mary is having maternal instincts kick in, and Mary's like, no, Jesus needs his sleep. Put him, oh, they're having a tug of war regarding baby Jesus. This is unbelievable. I think Mary won. Jesus goes here. No, no, the sheep won. Uh, Hey, let's pause it right there. Look at Joseph. He's like, what do I do? Uh, I got to rise up and protect the family here. I got to get involved. So Joseph gets up, but... He's not exactly sure what to do. He hesitates, and in his hesitation, Mary says, I'll take care of this problem, and look at that. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Can we replay that again? Let's just go back. Watch this. Full uh, arm hold, body slam. Oh, my goodness. That's what I'm talking about. I was fighting for the Lord right there, huh? Oh, very fun. Well, again, I think Tegan felt like, you know, what am I? A sheep? You know, sheep are kind of not the star of the story by any means. You know, arguably who gets even less love than the sheep is the caregivers of the sheep, the shepherds. Did you notice they didn't even make it into the little nativity there? No shepherds. Shepherds often didn't get overlooked. Even last night as our family set up our nativity set, I noticed that we've got three wise men You know, the Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men. It just says there was more than one. The Bible also says, doesn't say how many shepherds there were. It just says there were more than one. And there's only one shepherd in my nativity set, the poor shepherds. Often overlooked, but not at the Compass Church this year. We've got five-week series all about the shepherds. This is their time of glory. There are eight, uh, no, 13 verses in Luke 2 that focus and the shepherds and what they experienced. And friends, we're going to spend five weeks diving into that experience because it's huge. And that midnight clear, those shepherds saw things, learned things, heard things, experienced things that changed their lives forever. And I want to like go back in time. I want to try to go to the hills of Bethlehem in that first Christmas. And I want to watch up close and try to experience with the shepherds all that they experienced. And over the next five weeks, friends, as we see what they saw, as we hear what they heard, as we experience what they experienced, you know, it marked them forever and it'll mark us forever too. If your heart's open and your mind engaged in the Word of God, this stuff will change your life in the most beautiful ways. So here we go, week one. And I want to start reading in Luke 2, 
verses 8 through 10. There were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. You remember the context. Uh, This is the night that Jesus was born. Mary and Joseph have come from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register for the census, found no room in the inn, and so they had to go and found a place among the animals for the baby to be born. And in this humble setting for Jesus' birth, the Lord arranges for some people to celebrate. What's a birthday party with no celebrants? And so the, the shepherds are tapped on the shoulder by God himself, saying, I want you to be a part of this glorious moment. Now, let me highlight uh, living out in the fields. This is really important. As we seek to understand the life of these shepherds, you should know that they did not have a glorious occupation. They had to live in the fields. Shepherds in that day were not in a beautiful farmhouse with their sheep nicely in a penned up yard. No, they were nomadic. They traveled with their sheep looking for pastures that were green. Any green would do. And as a result, they slept on the ground night after night. They lived out under the stars. And some of you are like, ah, you're outdoorsmen, you know. Yeah, I'd love to be a shepherd, to go three months without a shower. Yeah, well, uh, most people don't like that. And they didn't like shepherds in these days either. Pious Jews avoided shepherds. They smelled. They were uncouth. They were ceremonially unclean. They didn't allow a shepherd to enter their house. They didn't allow a shepherd to enter the temple courtyard. They were not allowed to come and worship. They were just outcasts of that society. First century Jews have records describing them as all shepherds are liars and thieves. And as a result, you legally could not have a shepherd as a witness in the court of law. Because it was just assumed, they'll, they'll just lie. That's what shepherds do. And so these guys were despised by their society, but adored by God. Don't you love that our God said, who should I invite to celebrate the greatest moment in human history? I'm going to invite the least of the least. The shepherds, come and be a part of celebrating the coming of the Messiah. Oh, let's highlight this. The glory of the Lord shone around them. This statement is often overlooked, just kind of skimmed by. We get into the angels, because the angels, you know, sing, big choir, say a lot, and we're going to learn and be transformed by their message, but I can't skip over this statement. In fact, today's message is called the glory of the Lord. The totality of our time today is going to be focusing in on what does this mean that the glory of the Lord shone around them. Picture them on the hills, angel appears, and then all of a sudden, this glory. What is the glory of the Lord? That's a fair question. Well, a hint is that it it shone, it it shined. Uh, Shining, when the glory of the Lord appears in the Bible, the biblical record, often, maybe most of the time, It is described as a light shining, emanating from God himself. And not only shining, uh, it says it shone around them. They were enveloped with this divine light all around them. And that's cool. That description is helpful, but it's insufficient. At least I find it. So I want to say, tell me more. What did they see? What did it feel like? How did it mark them, this encounter with the glory of the Lord? And to better understand what this statement enfolds, what's in this experience, we got to go to the Old Testament. In fact, I want to take you to four biblical characters in the Old Testament who encountered the glory of the Lord. Each of these four accounts helps us understand what the glory of the Lord is a little better, helps us understand what the shepherds experienced on the first Christmas. And so let's start, shall we, with Moses. Oh, Moses loved the glory of God. Look at Exodus 33, verse 18. Then Moses said, and he's praying to God here, he prays, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness 
to pass in front of you. (laughs) First of all, nobody had experienced more of the glory of God than Moses. So I find it ironic that he's the one who's praying, oh, this is what I need, more of your glory, please show me your glory. But Moses knew as much as he had experienced of God's glory, he had only tasted the tip of the iceberg. There was so much more, and so he begs, God, do it again. Now, God says yes with unusual words. God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. You want to see my glory? Yes, here's my goodness passing in front of you. I I would define glory with these words. The glory of God is his character on display. Those invisible attributes made visible. Character on display. You should know that it's always on display. If, If God's character is not shining forth, it's not glory. Glory is always his character on display. And that's in this verse when it says to pass in front of you. That's the revelation of his goodness. But at its heart... The glory of God. It's not just light. Light is a helpful image, but you got to know that there's something special about this light. This light is the tangible shining of God's nature, his character, his attributes on display. I'll let all my goodness come before you. Well, God does just that. Moses goes out on Mount Sinai. God led him to a cave. He stood at the mouth of the cave. God said, are you ready? Here we go. And God covered his eyes because had Moses seen the fullness of God's glory, it would have, boom, he would have died right there. It was too much for him to handle. So God covered his eyes. And as God passed by and Moses felt the warmth of God's glory, God declared his glory verbally with a description of himself. God described himself. Let me read it to you. This is found in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. The Lord's passing by, and the the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord. That's the divine name. Uh, Yahweh is what's translated the Lord here. Yahweh, Yahweh is my name, God says. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, a Abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Friends, those words are so popular. They have been called the divine attribute formula by theologians. And that divine attribute formula is found 31 times in Scripture. 31 times, Scripture quotes what God said about himself at Mount Sinai to Moses. It's the most quoted by Scripture, Scripture, in all of the Bible. Do you know that? It's as if God says, you want to know what I'm like? Here you go. I am compassionate. Can you see his eyes? I am gracious. I'm abounding in love for you. I am faithful. I am forgiving. Friends, these words deserve our recognition, study, meditation, memorization, because they are a snapshot of the heart of God. It's the glory of God revealed in words. At its core, the glory of God is what God is like. If you say, ah, I know the glory, I've seen the glory of God, what you're saying is, I understand what he's like. And here's the deal. All of us have received some of God's glory. We have a, a little bit of an understanding of what he's like, but for all of us, like Moses, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. He is so much better than you ever imagined him to be. His love is so much more reckless than you ever thought or hoped His grace is astounding beyond your wildest dreams. And as a result, we should pray Moses' prayer. Show me your glory, Lord, because I only know you a little bit. Well, what happens? After Moses has this profound encounter with God's glory, he comes down off of Mount Sinai, and look what happens. Here I'm reading in verse 29. Moses was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. (laughs) You remember glory shines, it radiates? Well, God radiated, shined on Moses, and now Moses is shining. Isn't that fun? Friends, this is one of the effects 
of an encounter with the glory of God. In fact, you'll see I got the word transform here. I want to provide, I have four biblical characters I want to tell you about in their encounter with God's glory. Each of them give us an effect of the glory of God in our lives. And the one Moses brings us is this, the glory of God will transform you. When you see it, when you encounter it, it'll mark you. You'll, you'll glow. Some of the attributes you admire about God will now be displayed in you. That grace that you can't believe that you're looking at in God, you'll begin to emanate some of that grace. That love, you'll show some of that love. Um, uh, this is evident in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Check this out. It says, those who gaze upon the Lord's glory will be transformed to be like him. Another way to say it is we tend to resemble that which we worship. The more you are just preoccupied with God and worshiping him, oh, I love this about you, I love that about you, when you go about in life, it just, you glow. You're different. He's rubbed off on you. His glory is now a part of you. And so one of the reasons we want to say, show me your glory, is so that we'll be transformed by it. That's the lesson of Moses. Now let's turn to King David. David, too, loved the glory of God. You know, David wrote much of the Psalms, and I have a couple passages from the Psalms I want to share with you. This one is Psalm 63, verse 2. David writes, Lord, I've seen you in the sanctuary, and I've beheld your power, and I've beheld your glory. There it is. And Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. David is talking about the revelation of God's glory in the context of worship. He was at the sanctuary worshiping God. Maybe you've experienced this. I know I have. We're during a worship song. Woo! It's like the hair on the back of my neck stands up. I, I just find those words conveying, or maybe the music is revealing, but somehow I sense a little bit more how extraordinary our God is. In those moments, we're encountering his glory. And a centerpiece of God's glory is his love. And David says, because your love is better than life, <laughs> I will glorify you. David says, when I'm in church and I'm worshiping you and your glory becomes evident to me, your love envelops me, he says, that's as good as it gets. David says, this is coming from a guy who was king. Remember, he had all the money you could ever dream of, all the palaces, all the wives, all the fame, all the opportunities, and he's like, you're going to have it all. I want the glory of God. In fact, I'm going to put the word delight. If, if Moses taught us that the glory of God, when you see the glory of God, it'll transform you, David teaches us that when you experience the glory of God, it will delight you. His love you get loved by God in that way, it is better than life, all of it added up together. This delight in the glory of God is evident in another verse. Here's Psalm 27, verse 4. David says, one thing I ask from the Lord. You know, like rub the, the genie's lamp, I got one wish. Okay, here's my one wish. One thing I ask of the Lord. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that's at the sanctuary, all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. David's like the coolest, most fulfilling, delightful experience is when you gaze on the beauty of the Lord. If you think an encounter with the glory of the Lord is, oh, I discovered that. That's interesting. Let's move on. No, no, that's not gazing. That's glancing. Like when you go to the Art Institute and you stand, you maybe you've never done this, but go, people do do this. They'll stand in front of a piece of art for 10 minutes, basking in its beauty. So we can meditate on the glory of God. We can find in Scripture his heart revealed to us and say, oh, I can't leave it. I got to circle it. I got to I got to think about it. I need to stare at it. I need to enjoy it. I need to gaze at God's beauty and the doing fills the heart with delight. David makes that clear. You know, C.S. Lewis has an interesting quote that relates to this concept of delighting in God. Here, here's the quote. Lewis said, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find where all, the place where all the beauty comes from. Isn't that an interesting quote? Lewis was a Oxford professor 
an atheist for a long time. Even in his atheistic days, he was so miserable. But every once in a while, beauty would make him come a little bit alive. He'd see beauty in poetry or in a song or in art or in nature. And he'd be like, ah, that is gorgeous. And he had this conviction that he had to chase after the beams of beauty to see where they emanated from. He was on a quest to find ultimate beauty and goodness. He had this sense of, I wouldn't long for perfect love if it didn't exist. It's got to be out there. And at the age of 32, his quest was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He became a Christian. In his whole life, his greatest joy was pursuing glory, beauty, the perfect love of God. The more he understood and experienced the perfection found in the person of our Lord, the more he found his heart overflowing. It was the sweetest part of his life. He was addicted to the glory of God. I hope you are too. All right, so David taught us that uh, the glory of God will delight you. Now let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah, like David, had an experience of the glory of God at church or in the sanctuary, the temple in Jerusalem. He was worshiping in the temple when God pulled back the curtain. That is, God made the eyes of his soul able to see invisible realities that were always present, just couldn't be seen. You know, God is... Uh, at each of our campuses right now. The Lord's present. He's invisible, but present. And in this particular case, God said, Isaiah, you want to see something really cool? And in a vision, Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. Actually, if you read Isaiah 6, you find that it seems Isaiah couldn't look up into God's face. It was too much for him to handle. So Isaiah ends up describing God's robe filling the whole temple And then Isaiah describes the angels that he saw worshiping God. And I want to read what the angels said. Isaiah 6, 3. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. I love that line. The whole earth is full of his glory. As if Isaiah might be in danger of thinking that the glory of God is only revealed when you're at church within the walls of this sacred place, the angels remind him, no, 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 no. The whole earth, if you have eyes to see, the whole earth is full of God's glory. The earth is made by God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The the nature that's been created reveals what God is like. Romans 1, you can read about that. God is saying, just as you admire art to know the heart of the artist, so the whole earth conveys my heart. I I snapped a picture a year and a half ago driving through Wyoming, uh, and I was driving down the road with our minivan, you know, with the kids in the car, and all of a sudden I'm like, Wow! Pull over, kids out of the car. You got to see this. And we just stood on the side of the road and I pulled up my phone and snapped this shot and I was led to worship. Have you ever encountered beauty of nature and you connected with God through it? You're doing that because you realize he's the artist and something of his heart is revealed in what he made. I looked at this and I'm like, Lord, you're brilliant. God, you are creative beyond all measure. You are beautiful as your art is beautiful. You are loving. You made this for us to enjoy. So many of God's attributes started flooding my heart, and I just worshipped him on the side of the road, standing in the gravel shoulder of the road as I looked at his art. Friends, it's all around. The whole earth is full of his glory, if you have eyes to see. Now, Isaiah hears the angels singing about the whole earth full of his glory. And then Isaiah feels really guilty. The holiness of God, in comparison, he is so wicked. And he just starts lamenting. He said, man, my lips have said the most awful things. I am an unclean man. And suddenly one of the angels flies to the altar, takes a coal from the altar. You know, the altar was the place of sacrifice, pointing to the cross of Christ, the place of sacrifice. And the angel takes the coal, touches it to his lips, and says, your sin is now atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. Again, this is the glory of God revealed in personal experience to this prophet Isaiah. Then Isaiah hears God have a conversation with the angels. Let me read it. It says in Isaiah 6, 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, hmm, who will, I'm adding the hmm, but uh, who will I send? Who will go for us? 
Isaiah says, well, I said, here am I, send me. Friends, one of the effects of the glory of God is that it will motivate, let's put that here, it will motivate you to Christian service. Isaiah's like, oh, oh, send me, send me, I'll do whatever you want, just say it. This is his response to the glory of God on display in his life. It's as if Isaiah was like, you know, I got one life, and there is no better use of my one life than to serve this beautiful God I have just seen. And the more you stand in awe of what God is like, the more you'll be like, take my life, Lord. I'm all yours. I don't want to waste my life on lesser beauties. You deserve everything. You know, some people think we Christians, you know, go to church and serve a church and are nice to people, all trying to earn our way to heaven. No, Jesus took care of that. We are fueled by glory. You want to know what motivates us? <laughs> We've got a glimpse of what God is like, and he has won our hearts. He is beauty like nothing else, and we're like, take my life, I am all yours. When you see the glory of God increasingly, you will be increasingly motivated to say, here am I, send me. All right, one more, and that's Elijah. Elijah was this prophet who came way after Moses, but he had read about Moses. He had read about Moses seeing the glory of God at Mount Sinai. Elijah's like, ooh, I want some of that. And so Elijah actually traveled through the desert all by himself to go to Mount Sinai, to the same mountain, to the same cave, with the same expectation, and that's to encounter the glory of God. Let me read to you what happened in his case. 1 Kings 19, verse 11. Elijah's out on the same cave where Moses is at. He's like, I'm ready, Lord. Let's see that glory. And all of a sudden, a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart shattered the rocks before the Lord. Friends, this is a tornado, a supercharged tornado. And I can imagine Elijah going, wow, I've never seen wind like this. Yes, this is what I was looking for. But the Lord was not in the wind. What? After the wind, there was an earthquake. <laughs> Ground cracking. Oh, here's the glory of the Lord. This is a big, bold miracle like I was looking for. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire, fireballs <laughs> falling from the sky. Boom, yes, fire. I should have known, Elijah says. I should have known the glory would be a falling fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard the whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face. Friends, what is God doing here? God's looking at Elijah going, oh boy, he read about Moses and the whole glowing thing, and now he's expecting the same. And God's like, you know, I bet a lot of people are going to read about these big miracles I did, and they're going to come expecting the same. And sometimes God does the big, miraculous, wow type of deal. But God had to reveal to Elijah and to us that his often preferred expression of glory is subtle, like a whisper. And uh, God's saying, listen, a whisper, if you don't listen for it, you'll miss it. If you're not looking for it, you won't find it. A whisper is the kind of thing you can walk right past. And so it is with us that if you say, Lord, show me your glory, I'm ready, send the fire, you're probably going to miss it. Because God may just send subtle expressions of his glory that if you're not looking for those subtle expressions, uh, you'll miss out. When you go to God's word in personal Bible study, you got to say, I'm looking, God. Show me your glory. Reveal what you're like, your heart, and what I'm about to read. Show yourself to me. And if you're attentive, you'll find it. When you, when you're, that's the word. When you're out in the world, look around and say, God, may the small dynamics of life or aspects of nature, may they reveal your glory. I'm looking, God. I won't miss it. Or Lord, let your spirit whisper to my heart. I'm listening. Those who look for glory find it. Those who don't often won't. And so Elijah teaches us the power of the subtle expression of God's glory and our attentiveness 
that must be in place. Let me tell you a little more about Elijah and his encounter with God's glory and, and what God whispered. You need to know that Elijah came in a bad way. Elijah was overwhelmed with life. You can read about that in the context of this passage. Elijah, his career was wrecking him. He was a prophet and he was going too fast. He was too busy. He was stressed out. There was a lack of career success that was depressing him. In fact, he was so discouraged that he was despondent and even suicidal. You can read about it. There was a prayer before this where Elijah just says, you know what? I'm done. Take my life, Lord. I don't care anymore. He was so discouraged. And yet on that mountain, when he encountered the whisper of God's glory, the Lord whispered, here's what he whispered. The Lord's like, it's not as bad as you think. This isn't the end of the story. I've got a plan. And these encouraging words from God were exactly what the doctor ordered. And Elijah came alive again. He marched off of that mountain and went on to serve the Lord for the rest of his life with renewed vigor. In fact, the word I want to use here is revitalize. One of the effects of the glory of God, especially to a beat up, worn out, discouraged heart, is that the glory of God will revitalize you and make you come alive again. Are you frustrated? Are you discouraged? Are you depressed? What do I need? What do I need? You need the glory of God. A fresh discovery of what your heavenly Father is like, a fresh encounter with his amazing love and compassion and grace, it will make you come alive like nothing else. Friends, and it, this is for new Christians, this is for, the glory of God never gets old. That's so cool. Sometimes, you know, people live in beautiful mountainous areas and they just grow used to it. You never get used to the glory of God. There is an endless depth of his character yet to be discovered. And with every growing realization comes new vitality that you've never had before, at least in response to this new glory that you found. And so if you find your soul beat up, worn out, depressed, cry out, God, show me your glory. I need a fresh, a new, a deep experience of what you're like because you did it for Elijah and you can do it for me. Revitalize my faith, right? Born out of your character and nature. Well, let's use these four and apply them to the shepherds, shall we? Let's go back to the shepherd passage. It says they were on the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. Angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Angels, uh, I'm sorry, shepherds tell us what it was like to experience the glory of the Lord. How did it affect you? Changed my life, they would say. Um, ask my kids, they would say. Uh, they would tell you, I have been a different person. My growth in pursuing more of the glory of God has marked my character. It is the joy of my life, they would say. That joy I tasted on that night has led me to pursue greater knowledge of God, and nothing has brought me more delight, the shepherds would say, than who God is. Motivate. Woo! We're going to discover this later on. These guys become evangelists, motivated to serve the Lord. Why? By the glory of God. His glory is their fuel in service. And then revitalize. I imagine that they were worn out. I mean, their job never had breaks, no weekends for the shepherds. They were burned out, stressed out, and yet they never felt so alive after they encountered the glory of God. In fact, I, I imagine the shepherds gathering their children, decades later, gathering their children, maybe their grandchildren, around the fire. And I can imagine the younger generation saying, Grandpa, tell us again about that night. You know, the Jesus born night. Tell us again about the light. What'd you call it? The glory of the Lord that wrapped around you. And I can imagine the shepherds going, Guys, yeah, light is a good description, but you got to know it was more than light. In that moment, as this light wrapped around us, we felt the character of God. I mean, his love for us came just pressing heavy. His, this realization that he is more good in this world that is so evil and corrupt, that God is the ultimate good, that he is unmarred by any corruption. I just knew it. I felt it. 
his grace, his compassion, his laughter. Guys, I, I just saw God. And then you know what they would say? They would say, kids, my greatest prayer for you is that you'd see the glory of God. My greatest prayer for you is that somehow God would, you know, big boom or a little whisper, somehow break into your life, that you would seek and that you'd listen and you'd look and that you would see how great our God is because if you can see what he's like, you'll love him forever. He will be the obsession of your life. I've seen the glory of God and I want you to as well, they would say to the kids. Shall we pray? Let's do it. Lord, our, our prayer is the prayer of Moses. <laughs> Show me your glory. Lord, we ask, Lord, would you make the Compass Church a group of people who are increasingly seeing your glory? Would you reveal yourself in your word as we study it, in your world? Would you whisper by your spirit? Lord, in a thousand little ways, would you reveal your heart to us this day, this Christmas season? And would we just come alive? Would there be a joy and spiritual vitality in us, in our church, born out of nothing less than the glory of God revealed to us? Show us your glory. Even as we sing songs now. You know, with David and Isaiah, it was in the context of worship that you showed their, your glory. Maybe even as we sing songs, you can reveal through the words or just through your, your spirit that you are present and that you are beautiful and that you are loving on us right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.